again. Right. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to try and talk about technology in 20 years' time. Now, I picked 20 years because today is a, a, an interesting day. It's, it's been about 20 years since the gathering started. And 20 years ago, this month, was the first graphical web browser, right? The World Wide Web was created just over 20 years ago. Now, most of your time, a lot of your time now, is spent on the web. And that was 20 years. So what's going to happen in the next 20 years? Um, and partly what I'm wearing here is about what might happen in the next 20 years. So let's, let, let's look back, and we'll, we'll do a little bit of a, a, a trip back. So 1992, we have the World Wide Web. We have the first graphical browser. And the gathering started as an official event. 98 was Google. All right, so this is less than 20 years old. Um, Facebook is 2004. Facebook's eight years old. All right, Facebook is a tiny eight-year-old, right, very young. So what might happen? What is happening now? Where, where might we go, particularly with gaming? Well, one of the things that I think is going to be very important and is becoming more and more important is augmented reality. And that's what I'm wearing this is about. Right? This is about augmented reality. Now, if we have a look at what we can currently do with augmented reality, and I've just got to get my mouse working again. Augmented reality, if you have a look um, in the last month, Google presented their Google Glass, their project on using augmented reality as your new phone. Right, so Google want to move your Android phone away from you having to have a screen and having to press buttons on a screen and moving it up into your glasses. They want to have your contacts be augmented in your environment. This is starting now. Right, so at the moment, we are moving into a world where we're going to have an augmented world. We're going to see the world in new and interesting ways. Um, and that creates some interesting potentials for gaming. So this is a, 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 a demo video of, of what it might look like. Right? Um, this is a little bit old now. Um, I'll just see if I can get any audio. Um, and so this guy's wearing a huge headset. But technically, I don't need the headset. Google has the wee glasses. So the idea here is you should be able to wander around in front of the gathering here. I should have monsters popping up, and I should be able to shoot them as they come out from around you guys. Huh? Um, now, this kind of in-real-world gaming experience is going to become possible. And in fact, in 20 years' time, in 2032, I think this is going to become quite commonplace. Right? This style of gaming is going to be one of the most frequently used styles of gaming. I'm having real trouble with that. Um, however, as we move into a world of augmented reality, you get to see that someone's going to pay for it. And how do we pay for it? We pay for it by having adverts everywhere in our world. Right? So this guy is... is another concept video of augmented reality, saying, well, if we can augment our world, what might that look like? And here you can see he's, he's able to bring up recipes. It's able to detect the, the, the items in his environment. It's able to kind of add information. It can give him instructions on making a cup of tea. Um, it is a, a new way of seeing the world. Now, already we can be paid for seeing adverts. And so in this world, there are lots and lots of adverts. And while you're viewing adverts, you're getting paid. When you go into your see your connections area, you're not being paid anymore by the advertising companies, but you just get to, to use your, um, the, the augmentation around you to navigate your world. And this is one of the things about augmented reality is the idea that it's not just going to be used for games. It's going to be used to provide us a new way of searching the massive information space that the internet provides us. One of the main problems we have now is we're 
too much data, right? There's too much information coming in. And so we need new ways of seeing it, new ways of browsing it. So you're watching this guy and he's, he's got kind of... He's able to turn up the advertising, right? And that'll give him more money, right? Because he sees more ads, you get more money. Now, this kind of seeing the world, seeing information, getting pop-up information, is what I'm going to be able to have on my contact lens because what? Because my contact lens already we've developed a system oh, uh, where you can display information on a contact lens. Now, this was a, an, an app that one of my students wrote, which is an augmented reality tower defense game. Um, this was at Uvic, and what you do is it builds the tower defense game on the grid you're currently standing on. Right? So it finds the map and it builds the roads using open street maps, and then you can run around and place towers to kill the creeps that are coming across the map. So this moves your game into your real world. With a heads-up augmented reality display, with the Google glasses as they are now, and with contact lenses in a few years, that will become even more immersive. Now, this is the, the concept. There's a concept diagram there of what a contact lens might look like. In September and October last year was the first successful experiment on putting an LED on a contact lens. So you can see there they're doing it with, with mice because they don't want to put it in, in humans' eyes yet. But the idea is that there's a gold ring that is the antenna, and it's also the power coupling. In the center of the eye is a small, single LED. So on your contact lens, you have a display. So when I look around, I get information. So for example, I've got multiple cameras looking at me. If I was linked in to which camera was recording me, I could have that information highlighted above each camera. Right? Currently, they do it with a wee red light that moves around. On my contact lens, I could have that and other information. I could have information about your names, your families, where you've come from, how old you are, anything that is public information, I could have in my iris. Right? Now, I'm also wearing my concept for a control system. Now, what you, you can see on my face here is the idea of an EMG, electromyograph, and some cameras. Now, how this works is that I will be streaming information from this. So my contact lens will, give, will be giving me augmented reality, and my cameras will be looking at the world and connecting to the world. And seeing I've got a Wi-Fi connection, I've got some cameras, I've got where I'm looking, um, I could share that. Right? So when you guys want to follow me, instead of following me on Twitter, you don't follow me on Twitter, you follow me. Right? You get to see what I see. You get to hear what I hear. You truly, truly follow me. Now, in 20 years' time, that may seem a bit freaky at the moment, right? You don't, you're wandering around and suddenly there's 15 people all kind of watching out through your cameras and listening to your conversation. But 20 years ago, Facebook seemed pretty freaky, right? That people would share things. Twitter, really? You shout stuff to random people all over the world about, I don't know, what your cat just did? That's weird, right? I mean, people were still fascinated by intercontinental phone calls 20 years ago. So the chances are that this sort of live streaming where you have a camera and you are constantly streaming to the web is something that's likely to happen. BCI. Now, this was me talking at the gathering a couple of years ago. This kind of connection, this connection to the brain, this connection to the world, where my technology, I'm sharing everything about me, I'm connecting through my eye movements, I'm connecting through my face movements, all of that is connecting together, including possibly BCI. Now, um, I personally think that EMG is going to be more useful. Now, EMG, I've talk, I talked about EEG last year. EMG is electromyograph. It measures the muscle movements. Now, there's a couple of things that are going to be quite interesting in muscle movements. At the moment, what I'm wearing here is measuring my eye movement. 
right? That's the goal. It would be to measure how my eye is moving. That allows me to track where my vision is. And if I can track where I'm looking, I can augment that with interesting information. And here, it's also being used to track emotional content. Right? Your, your, the muscles on your face tell a lot about how you feel. Right? And so we can give you both emotional content and we can track where your eye is. Um, one of the interesting gaming advances that you guys will probably see uh, in the next 20 years is that your muscles start to move before your finger moves. Right? Your finger is controlled by muscles in your arm. EMG, electromyograph, can measure those muscle impulses. So if you are playing a first-person shooting game, right? Counter-Strike, and you want to get a little bit faster, you put on a forearm cuff with the EMG on it. When you click your mouse button to shoot, it registers that and goes, ah, that's what happens when he tries to shoot. I can pick that up about two or three frames faster because I can pick up the muscle starting to move before the piece of meat at the end of his hand starts going up and down, I can measure the muscle movement. That gives me one or two frames faster response to shooting in Counter-Strike. Now, professional Counter-Strike players, a couple of extra frames, doesn't sound much for the rest of us, but that can help be the difference between a kill and a no-kill. Right? So this EMG, the the reading muscle movement is going to be quite important in future games. This stuff, opening your head up and putting electrodes in, um, we're still pretty queasy about that at the moment, right? Um, but in 20 years' time, we're going to have nanotechnology. We won't actually need to cut open your head. We will be able to inject a self-assembling mesh. Right? We'll inject it in, it will transfer itself to your brain, and then build the electrodes over top of that. Right? So when I want to connect the brain and when I want to have inputs, I can do that by using the, the nanotechnology that will be available. So nanotechnology. OK, I've mentioned nanotechnology. Um, at, at the moment, there is a lot of talk about nanotech right, in terms of very, 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 very fine movements, very, very fine machines that you can make. Now. The main use for these at the moment, commercially, right now, is in clothing. Right? Making interesting, different clothing because you can construct nano meshes that do interesting things. You can put sensors into clothing. You can put sensors on your body. For augmented reality, we're going to have the opportunity of not just having input through the eye and being able to sense where you're looking. We're also going to be able to sense your entire body, right? everything you're feeling. and with the right materials, we're going to be able to give you the feeling of being punched or hit or shot on the surface. The materials themselves will be able to respond. And so I'll, um, if I'm in a shooting game, I'll be able to duck. When I stand up, I'll get a, a chest shot, and I'll feel it hit me there. Because my clothes will be intelligent clothing. Right? Because the nanotechnology means that I can wear the technology. I can wear something that is intelligent. Now. There are other advantages to nanotechnology, and these are often in the areas of health. Right? And this is something that, that we're going to be exposed to and is going to be quite interesting, is, is health technology um, and the changes that happen here. Now, this is about to the end of the universe. Well, we're going to have some interesting social problems when we get too much health technology. One of those is you can already get your genome. Right, a $1,000 genome project, I can send my DNA in, and I can get a full genetic profile of myself for $1,000. This has been a goal for the last five or six years to do this. This has happened now, which means in 20 years' time, every one of you will have a, your DNA on sequence. Right? You'll have it yourself. It'll be something that is just there. So if you leave any skin cells somewhere, you commit a crime, every one of you will have a DNA fingerprint. We will be able to have DNA targeted interventions. Right? They'll look at your DNA and say, ah, you've got high risk of heart attack from your genetic code. Therefore, we will target this kind of healthcare for you. You are allowed to do this kind of job. Right? If you do these other jobs, you're not going to be as good at them. 
like that. You might be allowed to do those, but you're going to be discouraged. We're going to be able to do organ transplants at a much deeper and more interesting level. Uh, and at the moment, we can already replace the heart with a completely mechanical system. As dialysis machines get smaller and smaller, we can keep replacing more and more of your body. Huh? Now, at some point, replacing bits of my body, replacing my legs, you know, I'm, I'm still Simon, the lecturer, when you replace my legs. Huh? I lose an arm. When you replace my arm, I'm still Simon the Lecturer. You replace the other arm, I'm still Simon the Lecturer. I'm starting to get a bit cybernetic here. But you can replace most of my limbs, and I'm still me. Um, and in fact, you can keep replacing things. And most of the time, I'm still me. But we're still going to struggle with the brain. How much of my brain can you replace before I'm no longer me? How many blood chemicals can you change? How much nanotechnology can you put into my bloodstream, which changes the way I behave, and yet have me still me? Right? That's, that's kind of tricky. Um, and we've got another technology that's also coming along at the moment, which in 20 years' time will, I'm predicting, have developed, which is called neurogenesis and stimulated neurogenesis. Now, you guys mostly know that when you damage your brain, it doesn't really grow back very easily. Right? You cut off your arm, your arm doesn't grow back. Your brain's fairly similar. Right? You have a big stroke, and it takes a very long time for you to get stuff back. You have to relearn a lot, and you don't really get it fully back. However, in our brains, there is something called neurogenesis. Neurons, new neurons are created. And the current technology is looking at how we stimulate brain growth. Now, this is particularly interesting for dementia sufferers and for Alzheimer's. Right? Because as your brain gets older, you lose more and more neurons, and you start to forget things. If we can target neurogenesis, if we can make the brain make new neurons, then we're going to be able to solve some of the major problems, some of the major issues that we have with healthcare at the moment. My biggest problem with, with healthcare at the moment is that we are very good at protecting your body. Right? Keeping your body going, we can do that. In fact, we keep people's bodies going much longer than their brains. Right? My grandparents, my grandfather, has dementia. He is losing his mind. His body's fine, right? They can keep his heart going. They've got heart pills. They've given him, him, him operations. They've, they've remove small cancers and stuff. They, they can keep his body alive. But his brain is disappearing, and it's disappearing slowly. Right? This is kind of disturbing to see a man I knew slowly disappear. In 20 years' time, with stimulated neurogenesis, we can hopefully reverse dementia. That does create some interesting problems. If I can keep replacing bits of me, and I've worked out with my technology in 30 years' time, in 20 years' time, that I can keep regrowing bits of my brain as they get old, right? and my neurons die and I replace them with new neurons, how much of me can I replace before I'm no longer me? Right? Now, um, this is, is sometimes called the, oh, uh, the ship of Theseus paradox, because the ship of Theseus in ancient times with the idea that you had this, Theseus had a large ship, but it was made of wood and it started to rot. So he replaced a board. Oh, that's fine, it's still his ship. Then he replaced another board, still his ship. Then he replaced the whole deck, still his ship. Then he replaced the mast and all the sails, still his ship. Then he replaced all the rudders and all the, the metalwork, still his ship. But no part of it was that ship. So how is the ship that, was belo that belonged to Theseus, still his ship when he's replaced everything. Now, interestingly, we've got the, the Douglas Adams restaurant at the end of the universe as one of our themes here. Um, Douglas Adams talk, talks about the um, Tokyo, uh, uh, the Golden House. And if I just grab this. The Golden House here, Douglas Adams discusses the, the Golden Pavilion Temple in, in Kyoto. When he visited Kyoto, he talked to the travel guide and said, wow, that, that temple has really survived well, seeing it was built in the 14th century. 
Um, and the guide said, well, no, it hasn't really survived very well because it, it burned down and we rebuilt it. And he said, so, so that's not the original temple. It's, not, it's, it's a new one. No, 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 it's the original temple right? because they use the same kind of wood and the same structure and the same construction. And it's burned down at least two times and possibly more than that. And they've rebuilt it each time in exactly the same way. And so for them in Japan, it's the same structure because it is the same, it has the same desire, the, it, like the, the, the essence of it is the same thing because it was rebuilt the way it originally was. So for me, as I replace bits of my body, right, with artificial limbs and with artificial activity, and I start replacing parts of my brain with neurogenesis, I still somehow retain the me, the essence that is me. Now that's gonna be interesting to see if that's true because we don't know. And our technology will take us to a point where we're going to have to start discussing whether we let people die or not. Now, the, the movie we were just seeing in the, in the back room there um, with the, the how long you can live and, and you work and earn time and you die when you lose time. Um, this idea that in 20 years time, we are going to hit the point where you guys are going to have to decide, do you let your grandparents die? Or do you keep putting neurogenesis, do you keep replacing bits of their body, do you keep upgrading them and keep them around? Right? This is gonna become a massive social dilemma as our technology advances over the next 20 years. There are some interesting social trends that will have happened in the next 20 years. Um, one of them, I think, is, is on digital extortion. You guys have moved a lot of your life online. A lot of your information is online. Apple, with the iCloud, is trying to get you to move even more of it online, right? Everything is supposed to move into the cloud. When you move your entire life into the cloud, you open yourself up to a new form of extortion. Right? It used to be that people would come around to your house and say, give us money or we'll break your kneecaps. Right? That's the standard extortion. Um, and, and that works very well as a business model, right? because you don't have to do anything and you earn money. Right? Now, in digital extortion, if you give somebody all of your resources and then they say, well, okay, um, you're going to have to pay more this year to get access to that, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. I can just keep upping the amount of money I get from you because I now have all of your information. This is going to be one of the key defining arguments that we're going to have in 20 years' time about ownership of information and about extortion of, um, of money from people for what they feel is theirs. Now, the example I'm using here is, is um, from a game, Pony Stars. Um, which has since changed, but the, the, the original um, methodology here was that you have a, a pony game, right? And I don't know if you guys play pony games. Um, some of you might. But this is a standard web-based game where it's targeted at 8, year, um, eight to 14-year-old women, right? And they're given ponies. That's all lovely. And when you're given... And, and what they were trying to do is to work out how much money they can get out of eight-year-olds, right? What's, what's the best way of getting money out of an eight-year-old girl? Right? That seems pretty evil, but that's, that's the business model. Now, what they did is they, they, they did A-B testing, they did metrics testing to see, um, there was a metrics lecture earlier today or yesterday on, on how much return you can get per customer. And so they looked at various things, do you give them all of the items, um, like give you lots of ponies or one pony? Do you make them pot buy items per pony? Or do, do you buy a blanket and every pony gets the blanket? Do you have to buy food or do you get food for free? Do you have to buy brushes or do you get brushes for free? They tried all of these different models. And the one that worked the best out of all of the groups of a thousand kids they, they divided their user group into, the, the tool that worked in terms of getting the most money out of eight-year-old girls, was that you let them have as many ponies as they like. Right? Lots of ponies, that's all great. And it takes you time to go in and pat and care for and feed your pony. 
that seems reasonable. Um, and if you have 100 ponies, and it takes you 30 seconds per pony, right, that's getting 50 minutes, right? That's getting nearly an hour just to go through and look after your ponies every night. Right? That becomes quite a time load. And so what you do is you offer them a service, a fairy that will look after your ponies for you. Right? Isn't that lovely? If a, a fairy will look after my ponies. If I go away and I can't get to the internet, that fairy will feed and brush my ponies. If, however, I don't pay the fairy and I'm not at a computer, my ponies starve and my ponies get disheveled. And if I leave the game, they can send me an email with a pony that's starving to death and all disheveled and saying, please come back, we need you. If you get an eight-year-old girl to love a digital pony, you can get money out of her by threatening to kill her pony. Right? That's digital extortion. That is evil, right? But they've already done this. And it's the kind of thing that games and companies will do more and more of. They'll get your data, they'll get you to commit either emotionally or financially to the data that they hold on their servers in the cloud, and then they'll start upping the cost. All right? They'll start saying, oh, you want that data back? Well, you're going to have to pay, right? That's where one of the, the this, this cloud technology, this social issue of ownership is moving. Now, um, Disney has bought Pony Stars and they've changed the business model, I think, because they realized that that's not really the Disney way, is to threaten to kill people's ponies. But the principle here is that they weren't breaking any laws, right? The company owned the ponies. There were no real animals hurt, right? It was just. If you wanted to keep paying, that's fine. It's a, it was a free service to play. It was only if you wanted to keep all your ponies alive that you would need to pay. So, so yeah, there's no laws being broken. One of the debates you guys are going to have to have is what you do about this. What do you do about your data that's on the cloud? How do you protect that so that a company can't come along and say, right, no, we now own all that data? As gamers, you put an enormous amount of time into your characters, right? When a game company says, says OK, right, you've been playing our game, and now you, now you want to, to keep playing, you want your, your character, well, we'll just make you pay more money for that character, right? Because it's no longer on your machine. You have to connect to the server to get access to your character information. So at what point have you put so much time and effort into a character that you're starting to be willing to pay more money so that you can still access it. Gamification. I talked a whole talk last, um, last TG on gamification. It is a trend. It will happen. In 20 years' time, lots of things will be gamified. Right? And we already have a lot of this. Um, I can Facebook, and I can tweet my location, and I can Foursquare it and get rewards for having, having a location. Um, I will have a fitness program on my phone that, that rewards me when I go running, right? RunKeeper is a, is a gamification of going for a run. Um, my students last year did a gamification of driving, right? So when you drive places, if you drive smoothly, you get lots of points, right? So they have, have encouraged people to be smoother drivers by gamifying it. In 20 years' time, you will be able to do everything as a game. All the groceries you buy will earn you points and achievements. Everywhere you walk, your phone will record that and it will give you points. You will be gaming constantly. Right? There won't be anything but the game. Right? That will be quite a strong change for some people, not for others, for a lot of you. You're at the gathering. You game for five days. Right? This whole idea of everything being a game, yeah, that's kind of normal. But when even serious things become games, that's going to be another interesting social change. Um, I'm, not, I'm still not sure how they're going to gamify um, a funeral, right? what points you earn at a funeral, particularly if you're giving the eulogy, um, if you earn points for the number of people you get to cry. Right? Um, that seems the wrong metaphor for, for that. Um, as a surgeon, um, I get points for the number of 
operations I perform, maybe then I do some operations I shouldn't. I mean, as a lecturer, do I get points every time you guys get credits? Um, do I get points for every time I make a student cry who's cheated? Right? I mean, this is something I, I, when, when people, my students come to me, one of my goals, if a student comes to me and they've been cheating, is to make them cry, right? Because they should feel bad about cheating. Now, if I gamify that, I can get points and rewards, and I can become like get an achievement. 15, 15 kids made cry this week. Um, I, at what point does, does that become too much of a game? Um, <clears throat> now, gamification will have some effects on how you feel about your work. Right? It will give you more agency. Now, by agency, what I mean is you will feel more in control. Now, one of, the, one of the, the, the interesting problems with work and the way that work is traditionally run is that as an employee, you're not in control, right? You do what you're told. Gamification of your job will mean that you have more control. You feel like you are in charge. You have more agency. You are the, the agent. You are the actor in this world, right? So gamification will have some negatives, but it will have some positives of giving you more agency. It'll give you more feedback. Um, I always bemoan the fact that, that we have exams and it takes months and months and months between when you study and when you get feedback. Right? Games give you instant feedback. And as we gamify your life, you guys will be getting more and more instant feedback. You'll know how you're doing. You'll get more information. Um, and you'll be able to experiment more. Right? You'll be given more freedom. And this is because, as gamers, you guys are great at failing. Right? It sounds a bit silly. But as a gamer, you try and beat a level. Right? You die, you start again, and you get better. Right? In fact, you'll play games which you know you will not complete in a single sitting. Right? You know that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try this on hard. I will make it so hard that it will defeat me. Right? And you know that it's better to beat the game on hard than it is to beat it on easy. Right? Because the harder it is, the more challenging it is, and the more reward you get for, for completing, it, completing it. So this idea of, of experimentation and failing and trying again and succeeding is something that you're going to have more and more of in your real life. Um, I was talking to the CTO, the ex-CTO of, of Visma, computing company, and what he said to his developers is, he wants them to fail early and spectacularly. The sooner they can fail, and the more obvious it is, the better. Right? Which sounds a bit strange, unless you're a gamer, right? Because if you're a gamer, you can say, hey, I, I, I died. I can then change what I was doing and get further in the level. Right? It's not just keeping doing the same thing. And so as we gamify life, we're going to have these social changes. Now, in 20 years' time, the technology will have been developing, and it will keep developing. And the technology is going to be changing very rapidly. Right? Now, um, I was talking to some people earlier about the idea of, of 3D in games. Right? Is the, the 3D um, connect? and 3D TVs, are they going to be the big change in games? And the answer is, well, probably not. Right? I, yeah, you'll have a 3D gaming con um, PC, but not many of the people here are using 3D screens, even though they're available. Um, 3D isn't going to be the main thing. I think augmented reality will change the pervasive way you play games. The technology in 20 years' time will start what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, which is the singularity. The changes in technology are becoming faster and faster. When I have this on me, right, it's going to get so much information about my world. I'm going to be able to store so much information about my world. Right? With these three cameras, I can get a really good image of my world. And because we've got huge data stores in the cloud, I can save everything I see. I can save everything I do. Right? And because it knows what I'm doing, and it's gamified. It's giving me points. Right? As I move around my world, I can, at any time, decide to have a look back and see what I was doing yesterday. And I can just put in the date, and I'll come up with the stored video and audio of what I was doing at that time. 
And in fact, if I'm sharing and I've had people following me, they can go and have a look at it. So when I come up to you and we have an argument, or I have an argument with my partner, um, and then three days later she said, but you said that I was fat. And I can say, no, 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 I, I, I didn't say you were fat. <laughs> I said that you were thinner than other women. <laughs> now, we can then go back and find out that I said she was big. Hmm. Um, now, that's the kind of thing that this technology and the technology you guys will be working with will provide you. Already, there's a guy in the US who, has, who recorded five years of his toddler learning to speak. Right? That sounds reasonable. How he did it was to put a camera in every room in his house and put microphones in every room of his house and record everything that happened inside his house for five years on a huge database. Right? Recording everything. And then did the analysis to find out where all the words were. Right? And so he actually found out how his son learned to speak by recording every vocalization his son made as he went from zero to five. Now, that's pretty extreme, and it certainly was five years ago to record video from eight rooms and audio from eight rooms was a big database. Now, not so much, right? You've got live streaming, you've got huge amounts of data. You can put that all together and record a huge amount of stuff about your lives. As we game, everything you do will be being recorded. Already, the companies are recording a massive amount of metrics about you as a person and a player. Every time you play a game, data is going back to the server about what you're playing, what you're choosing to do, how you're playing. If you're playing a social game online on Facebook, it knows about your friends, it knows about your, your interests, it knows about everything you're doing. Right? Um, what will be quite interesting, and, and one of the social changes that is going on, is the, the idea that I'm sharing so much about me that if any company wants to know about stuff, they can probably find it. And they can probably pay somebody like Facebook or Google to give them information about my preferences. When I have this system connected up and I'm able to stream information, um, I ask my students to write a shout to tweet system. Because tweeting is like shouting, right? So if I shout, I want that to automatically be tweeted. Ah, that seems reasonable. With this facial detection, if I see something cute and I go, oh, it can immediately take a snapshot, load that to Facebook, put oh underneath it, and bang, I've got automatic oh detection. If I'm gaming and I'm playing the game with this on and I defeat a boss, I don't need to say send to Facebook. It's immediately detected that I've just beaten that level and it can instantly flash it up into my Facebook page, onto my shared profile, and tell everybody I care about that I've defeated that game. Right? This system where you are constantly connected and you have a camera and a, an, an augmented reality lens gives you the power to do almost anything in terms of sharing. That will lead to one of the other issues in 20 years' time are the social constraints. Um, we already have the technology now to have driverless cars, right? Google has a driverless car. It'll drive pretty much all the time, right? That's fine. That's great. Why don't we have driverless cars? Because of the social issues. We don't like being killed by robots, right? It feels wrong to be driving along and then have a robot driving the side of you. Um, and the company that makes the robot is going to get in trouble. As this technology advances, what are the social implications of live streaming all the time? If I come into a, into a bar and I start talking to somebody, if I've got a little red light on, do I need a little, one of these to be a red light that turns on when I'm streaming and turns off when I'm not? Right? Because are you going to say the same things to me if I'm constantly connected? Are you going to say the same things if I'm gaming? How do you know that my intention when I come up to you is to talk to you rather than I'm playing some kind of fake zombie killing game, right? Where my lens has turned you into a zombie and the way I defeat you is to get you to say the word banana, right? So that's my, that's my AR game that I'm playing. You don't know this. And so I come up and I start talking to you, trying to elicit the word banana out of you, right? Now, 
if you don't know that you're part of my game, right, exactly how will that change the way people interact? How will that change our social, uh, our, our social interactions? Um, there's a, a, um, uh, a YouTube video on, on um, Fat Man Rodeo. Uh, if you look up Fat Man Rodeo, it's, it's uh, Balls of Steel, a television program. And they made a game out of jumping on people and trying to ride them like they're a rodeo, rodeo horse. Right? That turns other people into participants in your game. If I've got AR and I've got this on, any of you could be in my game. Right? Any of you could be part of the game. Not, I'm not interested in you anymore. I'm not interested in the interaction with you. I'm interested in how I earn points for my game from you. This is going to be, in 20 years' time, this is how we will start interacting with each other. And this is going to be an, a kind of massive change in our social interactions. I'm not sure whether that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think the potential positives in having the augmented reality and being able to have fun anywhere and everywhere and be able to have that, my games all around me is going to be great. But the social issues are something that you guys are going to have to sort out. Now, your, your parents are already kind of going to be going to re, um, rest homes, but you are going to be the generation that deal with this kind of constant gaming, constant interaction, and pervasive gaming. So my take-home message is that AR is where it's going to go. Live streaming is where it's going to go. Sharing everything is where it's going to go. The cloud is going to have your data. Companies will try and extort money out of you for that data. And it's your job to work out how to control the amount of technology that you're using. Because the technology won't be the constraint anymore. Right? We're going to be at the point where the technology can do pretty much anything we want. The constraint will be our own social desires. So any questions? Wow, I really can't hear you. You're going to have to run up, seeing we don't have an audio microphone now anymore. What are your thoughts about the information police on controlling the databases? Because there has to be some kind of centralized storage for that kind of... Right, so, so police that control the data in a centralized storage system. Yeah. Um, interestingly, in Norway, the, the data directorate, the, the data till nil set, um, are, are this organization in Norway, and they've just told one of the Norwegian community that they can't use Google email. Right? They're not allowed to, to have the local community's email handled by Google because Google do not follow the privacy laws in Norway. Right? So the Norwegian privacy laws mean that you can't store your mail in the cloud like the way Google does. Right? So the, the issue about um, are there going to be police? Are there going to be people who are going to prevent this digital extortion? Right? They're going to, they're going to protect the databases. They're going to make sure that, that you have access to information and that you can't just have it stolen from you. Um, and the answer is, well, yes, there are. Norway has one. Um, the problem Norway has is that people will ignore it. Right? If the, the cost of the protection is so much greater than the benefit of using the service, People will give up their privacy. They'll give up their, their protection for a service. Right? And that's the model a lot of these companies use. People will give up information if they get something in return. And the amazing thing is people will give up their privacy even if the return is just in a game. Right? So are there going to be police? Well, yes. Will they be able to enforce the law? Maybe not. It's going to be transnational. And I'm not sure how we resolve that. Right? I'm not sure. These databases are in the cloud, and by definition, they could be anywhere. Right? Um, it, you could get personal clouds, you can get country control clouds. And so, if, if we were going to do that, we'd need Norway to have its own Google Cloud server, right? And Apple Cloud server. And so, we'd need to have them locally, and we'd need to control it, and we'd need to write legislation. But the problem is, the people who are currently writing that legislation aren't you guys. You guys understand how much data you share. You guys are the people who need to be involved in deciding what kind of privacy is acceptable and what, and what kind of sharing is acceptable. Because my, my parents' generation, 
have, have a, an old concept of a public and private face. Right? And they, they used to say things like, oh, I wouldn't do that in public. Right? But you guys do everything in public. So the idea of, of a public and private face, the idea of, of this privacy in the, in the cloud and being able to protect the data, that's an interesting, it's going to be a problem you guys are going to have to solve. So that's what I want to leave you with and leave you thinking about technology in 20 years' time is going to be hard to predict, it's going to be augmented reality, and it's going to be fun. Okay, thank you.